welcome to the D3Con podcast. In this episode today, we're talking English again because we have a guest here from New York City. His name is Mark Fogelberg. He's the head of agency partnerships and programmatic at EMX. And we're going to learn a lot about connected TV. I think that's the main topic. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Thomas. Great to have you on board. Um, CTV is uh, one of the key things that we're going to learn about, as I said already. But first, uh, I would suggest we learn a little bit about you and your background. How did you get into the advertising industry and how did you get into this interesting position at EMX? And later on, we're also going to talk about EMX uh, as a company that probably not every one of our listeners has heard of yet, but we're going to tell them about it. But let's start with you first, Mark. Sure. So thank you. Um, I started out on the consulting side at PwC and I got the digital bug, as, as you'd say. And so well, really I got involved with digital back um, in, in wave one before mm -hmm. the first dot com crash. So that that okay. tells you how old I am. <laughs> and then I went to, to school and got my master's and focused in on the, the publishing and media side and, and worked in there. So I worked in um, in business development roles and marketing roles, and so had great marketing experience. I worked for um, BMW on the client side. I worked for mm -hmm. Cornell University, had some great experience, um, head of marketing for the a &A. And so what I was able to do was as I was building up marketing, I was constantly leaning into digital. And then I made the move to the sales and, and media side of things and had great experience with um, Time Inc, largest uh, magazine publisher. Um, had some interesting experiences where I worked at AT and T, and then I worked in the startup realm. So I worked for companies that no longer exist, mm -hmm. some that do, and I kept building up. And then later in my career, I actually went agency side. So most people start in the agency side and move in the opposite direction. I went agency side. I had some great experiences. Worked um, at Omnicom and Analect, their consulting arm, and then I worked for the chief data officer of WPP. And so mm -hmm. by then, I had gotten the data bug. I was very excited about what data can be and should be. And I've always been a fan of advertising. So for me, it was an ability to look at what might come next, blending creativity and data and um, an ability to do a lot more targeting. So as programmatic rose, I continued to work against that. And I arrived at EMX right before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so my job was to build out our voice with the agency community, get deeper understanding of what their needs are. And then from there, build up what we can do and what we should do. We, we as a company, um, EMX is one of the newer SSPs, mm -hmm. one of the newest with new technology. So as a result, we're a little bit different in that our technology was built now rather than then. And mm -hmm. so that allows us to, to work in 5G environments, to really embrace the post cookie environments. So we were built in a, in a non cookie world. So it was perfect for CTV. And that was kind of the core of what we're, we'll be talking about today. CTV doesn't use the old identifiers, it uses the new. And so since we were built for new, we were well positioned. And so we have some experts, television backgrounds and CTV backgrounds within our sales and product organization that allowed us to kind of step forward and grow the company. Um, a huge amount of our growth is in CTV. It's very exciting in, in the US. And so we're rolling it out into uh, UK and Europe in 2022. Okay, sounds good. Sounds interesting. Thank you very much. Um, as a head of agency partnerships, that means that you are mostly focusing on working with agencies and uh, somehow uh, explaining to them the new world of CTV that they need to buy because most of the agencies, as far as I can imagine, at least it's, in, it's the case in Germany, maybe you can explain to us how it is in the US. Um, they have spent decades buying TV and most of them probably right now are starting to to buy connected tv ads as well so i don't know what can you um what can you say about the us market what what is the situation there is it still difficult to get agencies on board and and um tell them how it works and why they need to do it so what's funny about ctv is that you you do have the tv buyers so traditional tv buyers doing upfronts doing massive plans and, and, and trying to build from there. And then over the past decade, you have a lot more digital rising in. And so if you think about the average age of an agency person is younger, a lot of them grew up in digital. So even the TV buyers of today 
grew up with a digital hat on. Mm-hmm. And that digital hat is allowed, okay, when we're buying CTV, is it TV or is it digital or is it both? And how do we bring them together? And mm-hmm. agencies, some are embracing the TV side of it. Others are embracing the digital side. Others, there's an amalgam of both mm-hmm. with a lot of data and understanding there too. So um, I won't say that every holding company has a unique message, but within even agencies, you'll find a, hey, this is going to come through the TV team because TV mm-hmm. is doing X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. And then others, you might say, because it allows for a lot of analytics, a lot of targeting, we're going to bring it from the digital side. And because everybody loves ads that have sight, sound, and motion, everybody wants to be a part of it. So you have some struggles, of course, in the agencies, but not as much as you would imagine. It's more like we know where the future is. We have our eyes set on it and let's go to it. And so our job as an SSP in exchange is to make a lot of inventory available. Mm-hmm. There, there are a finite number of publishers, if you think about it. It's not like it's not like the web where you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of different sites. In CTV, it's a more finite list of um, partners, apps, environments. And as a result, pricing has remained high. Mm-hmm. And the reason being is everybody wants it. Supply and demand says that there's demand is outstripping supply. So they're, they're keeping the pressure on pricing. It's kind of like how mobile was after the iPhone. Mobile was kind of lost, right? And then the iPhone came out and you saw the great, beautiful things you could do. And, and you saw some pricing pressures up in, in the more premier environments. Mm-hmm. Here you're seeing that the pricing is remaining strong and it actually helps growth. If we're not selling low CPMs, we're selling higher CPMs, it allows us to build better content, to repurpose, to give better ad environments. And so in the US, we're seeing this, this boom. And I have, I have a fact and figure from this white paper that we're releasing um, at the end of the year that basically says $13.4 billion will be spent in CTV in 2021 in our market. So it's phenomenal to think about a, a medium that's only several years old has already captured that much, but it's still tiny compared to television. Yeah, that was would have been my question. That's for the US market. And what what's the comparable figure for, for TV? Do you know that? Is it 10% or is it 30% already? I can tell you that um, if you can reverse the math, um, CTV, even though it represents a much larger share of viewing, um, the, the dollars aren't there. So it's it's similar again to mobile, wherein mm-hmm. for a long time, mobile was very important and everyone's using it and the dollars didn't follow. The dollars are mm-hmm. trying to follow. And we're seeing about 15% of quote unquote TV dollars going to CTV. So mm-hmm. the other 85% are still going into mm-hmm. television. But television isn't as simple as television anymore, of course, as you can imagine. So you've got live television and you've got the app environments that from, from um, the, the content providers. And you have all these different things that become television. And where is the line between what yeah. is television and what is digital and what is CTV? Yeah. It's a blurred line. And that's what makes it fun to talk about. Absolutely. That makes it complicated as well. <laughs> that's why we're here. <clears throat> Uh, I'm guessing that the um, the low prices that you're still seeing they they should be an attractive um, they they should make it uh, attractive for agencies right to get into this CTV space is that an argument or is the the other argument that you reach audiences you, to, that you don't reach through classic broadcast TV which one is stronger to get the agencies on board so if, if you think about the role of the agency with different brands. If, if you need mass reach, TV is of course going to make complete and total sense. You're going to have very low CPMs comparably. You're going to have some waste and you're going to have some drop off, sure. But when you start to do the CPMs in CTV, you'll see the scale that goes exponentially higher. So it's very odd to talk about um, TV environments with high CPMs unless it's something you have to be on, right? Mm-hmm. But in CTV, even even an unknown brand, meaning one that's pulling a, a small number, can pull CPMs that are five to six X what you might pay in regular television. So, okay. and, and what's really interesting is that from, from a data perspective, if you have a small niche cable network that's on mm-hmm. television, you don't even show up in the Nielsen ratings. You, you have an asterisk, which mm-hmm. means too small to measure. Mm-hmm. In CTV, there's no such thing. We can say, 50,000 people watch this show or this mm-hmm. series or this whatever, and we're served these ads and feed that back immediately. So a small player has even footing with some of the larger players. Mm-hmm. 
and they can they can promote their shows they might have a slightly lower less premium cpm but the but the cpm overall is still premium compared to what you might get on say a cable network at 11 p.m on a tuesday night so okay it's, it's all evolving I didn't know that, but you say in general, CTV CPMs are higher than in classic broadcast TV. I, I understood that in the other direction before, because I thought there is not yet enough demand for a CTV inventory, but you, that the prices are already higher. That's right. It, it's, it's actually the reverse. The, yeah. the demand from the advertising community post the COVID crisis has been much higher. Yeah. So demand, everybody is in on it. Everybody wants it. They realize the value. They're 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 forming different um, groups and teams. The clients are asking for and demanding it, yeah. and so you're seeing, the, like I said, the actual CPM pressures upward rather than downward. Very good for you as an SSP. <laughs> very good for our publishers happy. too. Our publishing yeah. partners like that. Yeah, I, 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 that's what I thought. It makes your publishers happy. Uh, <laughs> while we're at publishers, you talked about a limited range of publishers that you're working with. Um, can you give us an overview? Which are the most important publishers in the CTV space in the US market? Sure. So what, what's interesting is that you've got a blend. So you've got the, the, the traditional, say, network environments. Mm -hmm. So you might have an NBC Universal and all of its cable channels and all of its sub channels. And in CTV space, they might run on a Samsung TV yeah. or a Roku, or they might run on um, various different devices. It's all still NBC product, but is it NBC via NBC or is yeah. it NBC, NBC via an aggregate on Samsung or is it an, an yeah. aggregate <clears throat> across all these different partners? And a lot of the aggregators that are bringing things together, that's, what's, that's where it gets interesting because you have the sold inventory. So the first party sold that might spill over from the TV buys or the upfronts. Yeah. And then you have players like, like, like I mentioned, um, LG or Samsung that have TVs, but also have app environments on their television that have the ability to sell in. And then you have the aggregators. So the aggregators are those that take it, take it all and bundle it and package it and bring it forward. So the Pluto TVs of the world, for example. Yeah. So you have multiple ways to get to certain genres, but you can't really get to shows. And that's where it's very interesting because Sometimes you don't know with the shows that you're buying. So say, say you're buying on Roku, you might buy a genre, you might buy drama, or you might buy um, documentary, you might buy comedy, but you're not specifically buying into shows. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when you buy an upfront in television, you're saying you're, you're hearing the pitch, here's all the great shows and you're buying into these shows, but not all your dollars are going to be on those great shows. There's yeah, going yeah. to be a mixture. And sometimes the demographics and the target and the overlays adjust it in the same way with CTV. The biggest difference though, of course, is we can do things in real time. So if you're running something, we have an analytics platform that allows you to see where did you run today? And by today it's within minutes, you can actually go into the platform and see where you're performing and succeeding. And because it's not a weird click environment, like you would have in traditional digital, you have did, did someone watch the commercial all the way through? Usually they do because they want to continue to watch their television program, right? Yeah. Did, um, is it viewable? Of course it is because someone is captive. They're watching it. They're not, I mean, there's a chance they might leave the room, but in most cases, people are, are captive. They're, they're on their couch, they're in bed, they're traveling and they're watching and they're not being distracted. So again, it's, it's a huge advantage as, as an ad environment. And, um, and another key thing about CTV that we're seeing is that I don't know if you have the expression cord cutter in Germany the way that we do, but um, we yeah. see that, okay, well, 41% of people that are watching CTV in the US don't watch any or any linear anymore. Yeah. And that's and not, that's not broken out by just demographics. It's not age or anything like that. It's certain people want their TV their way. They want to be in control. It's a personality type. It's what they, they, they have interest in certain genres. And so CTV makes a lot of sense. The same way that people might have favorites on their remote control, the favorite channels, favorite shows on traditional TV, you've got that in CTV where people are really just um, homing in on what they want to see and what they want to watch. Yeah. Yeah. To make that clear for the for the audience members who don't know what cord cutting is, it's uh, canceling your um, cable TV subscription. And um, it's a big issue in the US. And 
also probably in in german mar in the german market although maybe not as big as there over there um but it's uh, it's a thing here as well i i personally haven't watched uh, broadcast tv for 10 years and i think more and more people also are switching to on demand tv because it just makes it it's just so much easier it's cheaper usually and um yeah it's it's definitely a trend worldwide i'm guessing in Germany, do you have over the air programming still? Do you still, can you still use an HD antenna and watch shows? It's a good question. It probably still exists, but it's very small. So most okay. people use, use cable TV and some satellite TV as well, but over the air uh, broadcast is, is pretty small, I'm guessing. I ask because I have an extra TV in in a in our attic space. It's a, it's a lounge area and I, um, I don't have cable or anything like that. Mm -hmm. but i can over the air because it's up high i can mm -hmm. capture all the ch the stations okay. so all the large linear stations in new york are forced to broadcast they have to broadcast okay. in hd okay. so okay. i can watch sporting events i can watch baseball or football or american football or any of those things for okay. free so it's kind of it's kind of interesting yeah and so it's it's tough to measure because you don't know who is watching over the air airways so yeah. that's, i'm sure that's another frustration for linear mm -hmm. they know that people are watching it but there's no it's not yeah. an easy way to prove that they are. Yeah, not, not an easy way to measure that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, generally, I think uh, you've been dropping a couple of names like Samsung and Roku already. Uh, so there is um, a very interesting race for who controls the access to the uh, connected TV right now going on, right? So it's Samsung that's trying to, that's making the hardware and trying to control the environment. There's also players like like Amazon with the Fire TV platform trying to control the environment. There's also Google that I, in, in my personal experience, I bought a couple of TV screens recently with Android on them and they are actually pretty good. So they're also trying to, to play a role in there. Um, and so what's, what's your theory? How's that market going to look in, look like in 10 years? Is there, do you, do you have any favorite who's going to, to win this race or are there still going to be a lot of different platforms in 10 years you're asking me to to, to, to ask which one of my children is the most handsome so i can't answer that <laughs> but what i, what I can say to you is is this there there is a fight for device supremacy right so when you're buying a new television i think something like 70 percent of the new tvs that are being sold are under samsung samsung is a great product great price point and they're and they're there in the us market lg with their oled tvs are phenomenal beautiful right and so they have um a share of the upper echelon and samsung hasn't matched it so they've been able to, to tick away and then you've got this next tier of great tvs sometimes brands sometimes not as known brands you might buy it as a second or third tv in your household so um in the us we love to watch tv you know that as you get older you watch more television and so some people might have a TV in every major, major living space, the, the bedrooms, the, the living room, the den, the kitchen. You might see six or seven TVs in certain large households in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So, And I'm sure that it's not always a Samsung. Um, but I can tell you that I think you're right about the, um, the operating systems. So Google might not have done as well with their devices, per se, versus a Roku. Roku, $50 gets you the most amazing um, device or Amazon Fire TV, amazing for $40, right? But Google with the OS is allowing others to, to play in that market and customize it. And so yep. um, uh, the same way that we have multiple television networks, the same way of multiple um, automobile vendors, the same way we have multiple of, of, it's great to have competition. It's great to have different ones. And um, I personally have TVs from the major suppliers. Um, you can figure those out. And I also have Roku and Amazon Fire. And the reason I do is because I work in the industry and I want to see what the environments are. So sure. I have to admit that. What's your theory about, um, I, I've been speculating or thinking about for years why Netflix is, Netflix is not offering an, a uh, basic uh, subscription with ads, like uh, even maybe even free or at least a little less expensive. And then with ads, why, why haven't they been doing that yet? Or is it ever coming? What, what is your theory about that? Well, well, their CEO says it's never coming. And if you think about it, it would be such a, um, a, a jarring experience after never having ads that I don't mm -hmm. think there's a place for them on mm -hmm. Netflix. In my humble opinion, um, there's a, it, it, 
if you watch Hulu, you you get used to the ads. And then if you go back and you watch Netflix, you're like, wow, there are no ads. And certain people love ads, certain people hate them. Um, what's interesting, I, I think I, people would rather spend an extra dollar or $2 a month on Netflix to not see ads because they know it's an ad-free environment. I'm not saying the ads are bad because that's what we do for a living, but I'm saying the environment doesn't match. It's, it's not like, I don't know about you, but when they first started playing commercials before a movie, I was angry about that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I just want to see trailers, which are long form commercials. I don't want to see commercials for Coca-Cola. And I was angry as could be. And I don't, I don't think Netflix wants to alienate people because now there's so many different opportunities to step away from a brand. And Netflix made the mistake when they tried to separate into two companies, they had the mail order and the streaming and people hated that. I think they know better. They have a lot of smart, aggressive people that know that an ad environment is not what, what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's see if I'm proven wrong, but my gut says they're not going to add ads. My theory is always that uh, it's certainly true for you and me that we'd rather uh, pay a couple of dollars and have no ads and experience the, the whole, get the whole experience and pay for that. But there's probably, I'm, I'm guessing, a couple of hundred million potential viewers uh, out there in the world that would watch Netflix, but they can't afford it. So, and they would accept the ads for that. You know, they, uh, of course, it would probably not be smart to switch paying customers to ad viewing customers. But to get new customers and new consumers, new viewers that wouldn't be able to pay, right? That that could be a potential market. But maybe it's also just others like Pluto TV or whatever is coming in the next years that are capturing that market, right? Right. And and in the US, um, when Peacock launched, so Peacock is under NBC, all their properties. Mm -hmm. You you can buy, you can get it for free with mm -hmm. ads. And then there's a premium tier and then there's a super premium tier and yeah. the super premium tier allows you to download it, take it with you to all these, and then be in a non ad environment. They, they don't break that out. Someone at NBC universal might have some answers there, but I would love to see where people are in the subscription side of things, because yeah. there's just so many services. Now um, you can have six or seven subscriptions that cost more than a cable bill. And so it's like this weird, where where is the cutoff? How many services do people mm -hmm. want? How many people? How many, how many can they afford? And if price is an issue, will Peacock do a lot more with the ads because people don't want to spend an extra ten dollars a month? Yeah. Who who knows? People are very fickle. That's what's great about advertising is right. We're 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 dealing with psychology as much as we're dealing with um with a business side of things. So yeah. you never know what a person's going to expect, and never know how they're going to act one one day or another. Sure. Uh, I would like to come back to the agency and advertiser side of the business and learn a little bit from you about um, what's what's actually what are you talking with uh, the agencies about? What what does it or what does what are their experiences in terms of what can they do on connected TV advertising that they couldn't do before? Is there what? How does it change the way they work? Why why are what are they doing? in this space so i uh, we've been talking about they can reach audiences that they can't reach otherwise that's pretty simple and that's uh, easy to understand but it, does it also change something in the way they uh, create their campaigns is there anything ctv can do that they couldn't do before maybe do you have some insights for us in that direction sure so th there's, a, there's a couple of ways to answer this so um in in one you've got micro targeting and so awesome. digital has made us expect micro targeting the ability for one ad to go into an auction and choose that one person that they want to connect to. Right. So mm -hmm. th there's that capability in CTV because you're doing an auction environment on every ad. So it's, it's not like you're buying things in bulk in the beginning and kind of stepping back and seeing how things do it's live tick, 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 tick. And mm -hmm. that's that micro targeting then feeds into the analytics side of things. So mm -hmm. you can do, multivariate testing to the nth degree, because you're looking at what type of creative is working, what length of creative is working. Can I swap in this? Can I change that? Should I be early in the pod? So the, the ad break, should I be late in the pod? Mm -hmm. Which ones are doing best? You can do consumer behavior analyses against those. There's all these things you can do for, for data people. You just get so much data and so, so much mm -hmm. understanding. And, and then on the other side of things, what's, what's technically possible. There's mm -hmm. of course, interactivity. So 
In fact, I was watching a, a show on Hulu yesterday and the screen shrunk and then up came a sidebar ad and you could actually take a picture with your phone of a QR code if you wanted to for it. I think it was 10% off of whatever. And I took a picture. I tried to take a picture of the ad because we were talking about this, but instead it took me to the site and I didn't want to go to the site, but I was like, okay, so they just got a, a, an impression because I was trying to capture it, but it captured the QR code instead. Okay. So that was kind of you know fun and interesting. And and um, and I go back to the the one-on-one direct TV was trying to do that, that household level targeting and some of the advanced TV players and set top boxes. So the, the Fioses and the, the ATT uh, U-verse TVs were able to do much more granular targeting. The problem was, is that as you got more granular in television, we're talking CPMs of $70 in some cases, just so high. But when you're trying to find a high worth target, someone who you really want to reach, it might be worth that because mm-hmm. when you talk about $70 sounding very expensive, um, if you look at magazine CPMs, they're still kind of high, um, but you have a targeted audience that you know you're delivering against. There's other areas where CT- CPMs are high. Digital has just taught us to go low, low, low. And the lower you go, you know what happens. The content might be not, not be as good. Mm-hmm. You might be in weird ad environments. You could have fraud, you could have bots. So CTV is trying to stay clean, above board, stay mm-hmm. fraud free. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's huge opportunity for interactivity for what's to come. And I, I'm sure we're only seeing, we're just scratching the surface. There's so much more soon. Yeah. Um, you reminded me of one thing that I was going to ask you about when, when, when you talked about what's technically possible. Um, when I'm thinking of, let's say I'm BMW and I want to target people on CTV that were on my website and configure the new M3 or whatever, um, is there is that possible today, or do you think it's going to be possible anytime soon that I can, for example, use my first party data to target CTV ads? I'll answer yes, but so yes, but if you think about it, in, in the in the traditional environment, cookies are still the dominant form mm-hmm. of um, of data and tracking, and so in CTV there are no cookies, right? So mm-hmm. what you need to do is. Earlier in the year, there was so much discussion of what com- what comes after cookies and this post cookie. And we, as an exchange, were passing dozens of different types of identifier. So you have the identifiers coming from Google, the identifiers coming from Trade Desk, the UID too. You've got identifiers that are aligned with the holding companies. And so here here you go. Instead of having a cookie with a common language, you have IDs with a not so common language. Mm-hmm. So say so you have these IDs. And they might map to um, a household or an IP address. They might map to certain um, propensities and activities. You take that and you put it into your first party data database. You need to act very quickly on that data before it becomes stale. So, mm-hmm. so, so like you said, I, I can figure an M3 on BMW and I'm not quite sure. If BMW has their, their ducks in a row, if they're, if they're really aligned, they can say, okay, let's get this person or sorry, this this household or this mm-hmm. this um, this person making this activity, let's put them into this targeting pool and show that they are an in-market BMW shopper. Let's map that together with, with our partners, our agency partners and our data partners and figure out where else might we connect with them on a household level. Mm-hmm. So say I'm configuring on my computer and I go and I turn on my CTV at the end of the night if they are as advanced as they hope to be, you might be able to to hit them up with a BMW M3 ad. Mm-hmm. Boom, and that would that, that would be amazing and creepy all at the same time. But I think that <laughs> I think what we're getting there. Um, a lot of brands are taking uh, charge. They're, they're DMPs were so important to agencies years ago, and now CDPs are the the, the new acronym. And so those are customer data platforms, which are basically. Um, the next iteration of CRM, right? So yeah. who should own that? The marketer feels that they should own that. And the marketer takes that data and they have to be able to act very quickly and then be able to to to, to go and, and target those individuals. So yes, it's technically feasible. I don't think it's widespread yet, but you know what happens in advertising. It'll be widespread next year or the year after. We just have to, have to watch and, and watch it evolve. Hopefully. So uh, what you just said is, uh, I, I found that's pretty interesting that you said these 
technical possibilities of showing me uh, the BMW that I just configured in the TV ad is um, just as uh, amazing as it is creepy to many people. That's, that's the reason that brought us all these uh, GDPR and uh, privacy problems that we currently have. So unfortunately, that doesn't make it easier, right, to, to target the right people and to create successful campaigns in this uh, complete uh, in this um, comp complicated environment that uh, the legal uh, issues that we had has com has created right so it's um, as far as i understand there's still in in ctv it's also a lot of uh, content and, and context related targeting going on and not that much individual household style targeting right so that's one of the one of the things the large advertisers are doing when they're seeing it's getting more complicated to really target audiences that I would would have liked to target, but it's they're afraid of being creepy, right? <laughs> but 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 think about it this way: um, Google is onto something when they're thinking of, when they're talking about flock and cohorts. So in the U.S., we can look at something called the zip code plus four. Mm -hmm. So zip code is your town, but your plus four is a more finite. Um, list of households. I think it's 70 households. Mm -hmm. Often you are more like your neighbor than you are unlike your neighbor. It's mm -hmm. different in cities, but in, in suburban and more rural environments, you are more like. So if you, Tomas, are interested in BMW M3s, it's more than likely that your neighbor across the street would be interested in the BMW M3. So I could actually, if I could go and target your zip code plus four, it might be something that that makes a lot of sense and i don't know if you if you have the same thing in germany but i i've noticed that when a car gets popular in a neighborhood it seems to get because someone has that car and they park it out front and next thing you know you go by and you say hey there's another ford explorer and another ford explorer right and you see someone's lawnmower and you say hey that person has the same ego electric mower as this person and i i think it has to do with birds of a feather and, and we're on to something with that 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 sure. let's let's birds of a feather flock together right so sure. um you don't have to be creepy in that you don't have to say tomas this is the m3 you were trying to buy earlier buy it now mm -hmm. but you can say bmw brings all this um advanced sophistication it's it's the driver's car it's not for someone that doesn't want to be bmw is for you and you could be getting that ad and your neighbor could be getting that ad and before you know it three of you have purchased an m3 and bmw is happy right <laughs> yeah, makes sense. And that's probably um, a very human phenomenon that works uh, more or less everywhere in the world, I'm guessing. Right, right. So it's it's amazing how that happens. And, uh, and I'll just loop back to CTV is making this all possible, right? So mm -hmm. if you have a great television ad campaign and you this great creative and it's not connecting with the right audience on linear TV, we now have an ability to, to do more in the CTV. And I know we're talking a lot about CTV, but video, let's not forget video. Video on your mobile device, video on your desktop computer, video in other environments is still very valuable. And so we see view through to completion rates higher on great creative ads, as you would imagine. And there's room for great creativity and growth. And so if you're a creative and you want to test different um, scenarios, production costs have come down and, and there's different things that you can do where you can make 10 different ads for the cost mm -hmm. where maybe you had three in the past mm -hmm. and you can test that creative and test your assumptions, see what's working with markets. And then now you have the data and that data stream to back you up to say, Hey, we tested this, this, and this, and these are what's working. Let's put more behind this. Let's use this. And you don't have to wait three to six months. You don't have to look at Nielsen ratings. You can see what's happening in real time yep. and you can actually um, adjust your your creative you can adjust your strategy you can adjust your messaging now and so that's exciting yep makes total sense so generally i i would agree with you that uh, video advertising as a genre so to say is uh, probably the the going to be the fastest growing for for years you know we in the digital space, we had banners for decades that were dominant, but it's probably mostly because um, bandwidth uh, limits and uh, also the, what what you just said. It's uh, 
used to be expensive to create video ads, but I think it's going to be more, more and more um, the standard way of advertising that also even small advertisers create video ads because that's just what people most easily consume, right? So they, it's it's always easier to consume a film than reading a book, right? That's uh, right. that's just uh, why why video advertising is going to be the the biggest market uh, for a long time. I'm guessing. I completely agree. I completely agree with that. Um, there is a place for banner ads to build a brand to to to, to showcase, but if you can do what I said earlier, the sight, sound, and motion, that's where people get excited. We, we as creatures love stories. We love storytelling and, yeah. and, an, and an ad can tell a story in six seconds, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds. Um, and in the U S we also have 120 second ads for, for pharma. I know you, you're not, uh, mm -hmm. you, you don't, you don't get those, but those are pretty painful. Um, when you have two <laughs> minutes of a pharma ad, <laughs> I can <can't> imagine <laughs> no matter what they try, it's still painful. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Nice. Um, yeah. Thanks for that. For that, I think that was a very interesting uh, look into the future of connected TV and video advertising. Uh, also, for me, some interesting learnings from the U.S. market that we are probably also going to see in the next months or maybe even years uh, in the German and European markets. Um, looking forward to seeing that. And thanks a lot for these valuable insights, Mark. Thank you for inviting me, Thomas, and. Uh... I hope you have a great rest of the year and a safe and healthy 2022. Yeah, same for you too. Thanks for joining the D3Con podcast and hope to see you soon, Mark. Indeed. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Schon angemeldet für unser nächstes Event? Wenn Sie auf unserer Webseite d3con.de/slash Anmeldung den Rabattcode Podcast eingeben, erhalten Sie 50 Euro Rabatt auf alle Tickets. Wir sehen uns bei der D3Con.